Hello. Welcome back. Uh, um, before uh, introducing uh, uh, the next uh, lecture, Gregory, who already introduced himself, so okay. <laughs> it will be. So uh, I'd like to announce the first uh, change in the program. So tomorrow um, there is a lecture. The second lecture is by uh, Maurizio uh, Fagotti and. Uh, um, he asked us uh, whether uh, this could be postponed to Thursday, and uh, because tomorrow there is uh, this uh, seminar by Emmanuel Bloch uh, at CISA, and uh, this is a Boltzmann lecture, so you can uh, read more on the website of uh, CISA. It's going to be at the same time, at 11 a.m. So. Um, he would like to attend, so uh, we thought uh, maybe we could uh, have uh, uh, this shift. Uh, so that, um, and also for uh, those of you who want to attend, uh, um, maybe uh, we can uh, think about, uh, well, there is a shuttle bus going from CISA, from ICTP to CISA. I don't know about the time. But uh, maybe we can try to see whether something can be arranged. Okay, so, but in, in any case, I will say, tell everything to Erica, and she will update the website. So you just look at the website, and uh, everything will be clear. And so now it's, uh, it's uh, the time for uh, Gregory for uh, his first lecture. And so I'll just uh, let okay. him start. Okay, thank you very much. Good afternoon to everybody. So in this uh, afternoon lecture, uh, I will uh, start uh, to, to, to talk to you about uh, relatively broad subjects, uh, which has to do with the statistics of extreme events, say of extremes in general. Uh, this covers uh, various questions. Uh, and uh, somehow the, the, the title of, of, of these lectures uh, contain this uh, this precision, uh, which is that uh, I would like to, 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 to show you how we can indeed deal with statistics of extremes uh, in correlated systems. So I guess that uh, many of you have some of you, at least, uh, have probably heard about uh, these uh, such, such such questions, um, and uh, it's pretty clear, in fact, that uh, extreme value statistics and more generally uh, uh, statistics of rare events actually play a quite important role in various areas of, of science, uh, and this uh, includes uh, uh, many many topics, probably. Uh, we can try to, 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 to elaborate a, a list of, this, of, the, of, of, of these topics uh, where rare events actually play a quite important role in, in science. Uh, certainly, if you think about it, uh, the, the first uh, area that, that would come uh, to your mind uh, is probably the wide subject of uh, environmental sciences, which uh, uh, includes many uh, uh, Extreme events, uh, such, such as, say, for instance, uh, earthquakes, uh, war graves, 
and uh, many other uh, questions uh, related to climate science. Uh, and uh, in these uh, areas, it's pretty clear that having uh, a good idea, a good estimates of the statistics of rare events is quite important because, of course, although these, uh, these, these events are rare, uh, they may have uh, disastrous consequences, obviously. And so that's one subject where these kind of questions uh, have been studied uh, quite a bit. Uh, and there is actually a rather huge literature uh, in that context. Another wide subject where these kind of questions are quite natural uh, is the uh, questions of, I mean, the, 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 the areas or the realm of, of finance, uh, where it's clear that uh, one usually has to, to, to watch quite carefully when such big events, when such cracks or crash, cracks, uh, uh, say, uh, our, such uh, financial uh, crashes uh, that, may, uh, that may happen, which may have uh, disastrous consequences, at least uh, in, that, in that field. Sometimes uh, people also talk about uh, avalanches in this, in this case, uh, which are quite uh, closely related to this kind of, of, of questions. And it's clear that in, in, in this kind of, of context, uh, one would also have uh, I would also like to have a quite uh, good control on when and uh, how high would be uh, such big events. Now, of course, uh, here this is uh, a school on, on, on complex uh, systems in statistic, statistical physics. And uh, that will be probably, uh, and that was actually uh, my main motivation when, uh, we, when I started to, to study this, these questions. Uh, it turns out that uh, the statistics of rare events uh, play also a very important role uh, in the context of complex and disordered systems. And that was uh, realized uh, around the, 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 the early 90s, uh, where people working on uh, disordered systems, in particular in spin glasses, uh, realized that uh, these kind of, of, of questions are actually quite relevant. Uh, and I would like to, to give you some concrete examples uh, to give you a kind of ideas uh, why we should care about, about this, this problem. But before that, maybe I will just, uh, because I think that this is a little bit an obstacle to try to avoid to breaking it, but right. Okay, fine. So let me just uh, elaborate a, a little bit more on this, on, on, on this, on this aspect. So for instance, uh, in the context of uh, uh, complex systems, uh, we usually like to have this kind of cartoon where you look at the energy landscape of, 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 your, of your system. So basically, in this simple, uh, simple uh, cartoon here, uh, you plot the configurations of your system, which is usually a high dimensional space. But to make the, uh, the picture easier to draw, let me, let, let's just do it, imagine that it's one dimensional. And here, basically, uh, you would like to, to think about the energy of such a configuration, either the energy or free energy. And typically, I mean, in, in many of these complex or disordered systems, in a wide sense, at the moment, I don't speak about any specific models, but uh, you would imagine that uh, you have a quite uh, rugged uh, energy landscape like this, typically. And uh, if you look at the... Uh, the low temperature physics of this kind of, uh, this kind of, of systems, then obviously uh, you will, the, the, this low temperature physics will be dominated by the lowest energy states, right? So typically at low temperature, uh, your, your system will lie in one of these uh, minima of the energy landscape. And typically, uh, so if you look again at the low T thermodynamics, for instance, low T thermodynamics of such complex systems, then typically you would be dominated by uh, or given by this minima here, okay? So typically given by the minimum of. Uh, and so that means in particular that if you look at the fluctuations of the free energy, for instance, of such a system, then it will be intimately connected to the distribution of these uh, low-lying states. Okay, so that, that's clearly 
obviously an important quantity to, 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 uh, to compute, and uh, you would like to say something about the minimum of this guy. So that's for the statics. I was talking about thermodynamics. Now, if you look at the dynamics, it's also clear that if you look at what happens uh, about the dynamics, well, in the large time limit, uh, you know that uh, the system will be dominated by the largest barrier. So typically, suppose that you are here, but you are still far from the, so you are close uh, in energy uh, from the minimum, but still, uh, to get to it, you will need to cross this very high barrier. And in other words, uh, that means that the relaxation times in these systems will be dominates if you think that you have a kind of Arrhenius type dynamics. So if I just uh, denoted by BL here, which is the barrier in your system, then typically the relaxation time uh, TL would scale like exponential of BL divided by KBT. And that means that uh, if you look at the distribution of the relaxation times in your system, then the distribution of tau L, this relaxation time, there will be related to the distribution of the barriers there. So that's quite obvious here to study uh, uh, So relaxation dominated by uh, the max of VLQ, the max, the largest barrier. Okay. So you see two examples here. Of course, it's 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 a bit uh, qualitative, uh, but you already see that uh, uh, in both cases. So if you now look at the low T dynamics, okay. Uh, you will be basically uh, given by the max, what I've written there. So you have already the idea that uh, these questions uh, are actually extremely important uh, in this context. And that's why people uh, started, uh, again, in the mid-90s, mid started to, to, to study uh, these questions uh, with the, the tools uh, and the questions also uh, of uh, statistical physicists. Yeah. Right, so this is, uh, uh, this, this actually is called the Arrhenius law. So that's typically, uh, so if, if you really study this escape, escape time problem, so you really look at this kind of bistable uh, uh, potential, imagine that you have a two wells, then what you can show is that the, the, the time that you need to cross this barrier is indeed given by this exponential time. Okay? So that's called activated dynamics Arrhenius law. No, this, okay, uh, if here I, I, that's a good question. So here I chose to represent the energy landscape. So in principle, the energy does not depend on the temperature, okay? And then, of course, the dynamics itself will depend on temperature. And in particular, you see here that uh, the temperature is here. And this is correct at low temperature somehow, okay? But that's temperature is here. But the, the, in principle, at least if you look at the energy landscape, it's kind of, it's static. Okay, it depends on the kind of dynamics that, 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 that you give to your system, but usually the kind of dynamics, relaxational dynamics uh, that, that, that we study because it's relevant from an experimental point of view, indeed uh, drives you towards these uh, low-lying states. Okay. okay, so this is, okay, maybe two words are attached to that. Uh, so this is called activated dynamics. And this specific form is called under the name of Arrhenius law. Okay, so that was to set up uh, somehow the, 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 the stage of the motivation somehow of, as to why uh, one should care uh, about these questions. So in the following of the lectures, uh, of course, we will see some more concrete examples where the, 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 the extreme value statistics uh, appears uh, in more concrete examples. Uh, but 
But that's roughly the, 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 main, the main motivations. Now, the question is, what do we know about, uh, about, about, this, about these guys? Okay? So what do we know about this kind, this kind of statistics? Okay? So it turns out that, uh, oh, sorry. Yes, that's true. Here, okay. I, I, okay. This is this is this is a name. This is the name Arrhenius. Arrhenius law. Arrhenius was a chemist. In fact, is it okay? Fine. So, question now is, what do we know about these guys? Okay. So, it turns out, and uh, I will uh, say more during the lectures about it. But it turns out that, roughly speaking, uh, the statistics of uh, of rare events uh, in the general sense is completely uh, understood, or is well understood, I should say. Uh, that would be slightly more precise. Uh, is well understood in one case, And this case corresponds to the, the situation where all these, suppose that all these energies here are just independent and identically distributed random variables, then a lot is known about the statistics of this guy, and similarly in that case. So that means that the statistics of rare events is very well understood for identically, so for ind independent and identically distributed random variables. So what do I mean by that? So I will usually use this shortcut, IID, for independent and identically distributed random variables. OK, so one example. So rare events uh, actually uh, contains a lot of uh, Various questions. Some of them uh, will be uh, touched upon here during these lectures. But for instance, if you really look at the uh, the statistics of the maximum, so you just uh, give you a set of random variables, say x1, x2, xn. So that could be the energies that are here indexed by the by the configuration, or the barriers here indexed by L, or the temperature at a given time i, or on the day i, or whatever. So these are, suppose that these are IID random variables. And then, so you imagine that you have, you, you look at one realization of these N random variables, and then you look at the maximum among them. Okay, so that's basically what I was playing with before. So you look at this guy. Okay, so x max here is one of these rare events. Okay, so that's what I call here rare events. Now, for instance, one rare event is the maximum, okay, or extreme event, if you want. So if you look at the maximum of the xi's, then in this case, in the case where these guys are just independent and identically distributed, everything is known about the maximum. Okay, that means we know very well the statistics uh, of, of, of x max is completely, completely is known. Okay, so. Now, I will assume that uh, many of you probably uh, have not heard too much about this aspect, and I will start uh, in a few minutes. I will start by reviewing uh, the results that are known from that. I know that some of you uh, have already heard about it, but okay, I hope that uh, uh, it will be uh, good also for you to refresh a bit your memory about it. But once one has to start with something, and I chose to start with the simplest case. But the good thing to know is that in this case, everything is well known, and you will see that it's still quite rich, known but quite rich. Now, the point is that even though this is already quite useful in, in various contexts, uh, it turns out that uh, in statistical physics, and uh, in particular in the context of uh, in complex systems, it turns out that this variables x i's are usually strongly correlated. So let me just uh, give you a few examples where this is indeed uh, 
indeed the case. Okay, so this is, this is nice. Uh, there are other examples of rare events where all these things are well known for IIDs. This is also the case, for instance, of the record statistics, which I will talk a bit uh, about uh, later on. Yeah. So, by the what frame you have, uh, you cannot have a very easy discrimination. You just need something yeah, it's, far from the average. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so that exactly that's what I mean. So, so this is one example. Another one would be the, the for instance, the uh, the record statistics, which are also rare in some sense because they are singular, if you want, and, and as as you said above some average, okay? But just to say that, in general, these kind of questions are very well understood for IID random variables. Of course, then, you need really to, 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 to sit and, and, and to say and to ask, really, what is the precise question? But what I mean is that, usually, once you have asked these precise questions for IID, there will be a precise answer, okay? So that's good to know that already. But nevertheless, in many cases, uh, these va random variables that we have to deal with in concrete situations are not IID. And uh, therefore, one needs other, uh, other tools. And that will be somehow uh, one of the, uh, the, the, the theme of these of this lectures is basically how to handle these extreme statistics in the case of strongly correlated systems. So let me just give you a, a few examples of uh, I mean, basic examples. Uh, just. Uh, let me write this explicitly. Uh, however, uh, in many applications, concrete applications, as you will see, I mean concrete, many problems, at least, in many applications, uh, the XIs are not IID. So one first example, which I already uh, uh, mentioned before, one example is the example in finance. I mean, in finance, there is uh, a nice model that people like to study, uh, which is the Brian, I mean, random walk model. So typically, uh, if you look at the, 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 the stock option, the price of a stock option, say, at step n, or step t if you want, s of t, then uh, a good model that people like to, uh, to study is this exponential of Brian motion. Okay, so b of t here is a random walk, or Brian motion. I will come back to this a bit more, uh, in a bit more detail later on, if, if needed. Uh, but just to set it as an example. And so typically, you will have uh, these kind of things, right? It's an exponential because the price cannot be negative somehow, OK? Uh, and then, OK, you will have something like that. But usually, uh, uh, the idea, so for instance, you would like to know when, quite important question is, when, when do you reach the maximum here? Okay, so that, that would be quite, quite important. So this is s of t as a function of t. Now, this case, in this case, uh, you can convince yourself that the prices s of t are strongly correlated. And they are strongly correlated because the Brownian motion itself is a strongly uh, correlated path, in the sense that if you look at uh, the correlation between bt and bt prime at two different times, then this will be proportional to the minimum of t and t prime. Okay. And so there is no uh, decaying correlation in this case. Right? So you see that there, is, there are very strong memory effects in these kind of things. And so that means that if you look now at the, uh, for instance, if you look at S max, uh, which will be the max uh, over a given interval, say between 0 and t of st, and obviously, because of these properties, this ST there are strongly correlated. Okay, there is no decaying correlations there. And so you are facing here a problem uh, where these STs there are strongly correlated. I don't know, maybe it's already too, too down here. Is that clear? Right? Okay, so that's, that's one example. And obviously, in this case, what you will know, what, what we will learn from this IID uh, framework is just useless. Okay. Is that okay? So that's one example uh, from finance. Of course, 
these questions related to Brownian motions also are quite, quite important uh, in various areas of physics because it has many applications. And I will actually, uh, later on, I will cover in detail the, the, the extreme statistics for such Brownian motion. You will see uh, how, uh, how far we can go. Now let me just uh, give you uh, yet another example, another famous example, I should say, uh, from a statistical mechanics of disordered systems where you could easily see that the correlations are, are strong. Uh, this is the famous example of the directed polymer in random media. Okay, so that's another example where, where the, 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 the IID case is completely, completely irrelevant and where you need, where you need some uh, additional tools, uh, which is the, and this, this is really in physics in this case, and this is the, the problem of the directed polymer in random media. So, in a random environment. So, of course, I will not treat uh, the whole the whole problem uh, in, in, in full details because it's it's quite quite hard one. But what is it about? So, you let's consider uh, a square a square grid, square potential, say like this. Okay, so this is my, my square. And now, uh, so I will start to, to do some random work, if you want, which are directed, and I will construct, and this random work will construct uh, a polymer. So how do you do that? So you start, you start from the top here, and then at each time step you just go randomly to go to the right or to the left. And uh, you will have something like that, right, typically. And you will end up to some point here. So that's sometimes people like, I mean, we like to, to, to think about this direction as time. So it's directed, okay, so it just, it can always only go uh, uh, bottom-wise. Now, so this is one polymer here. Now I want to assign an energy to this polymer. So how do I do that? Well, what I will say is that on each, on each side here, so I have a site IJ, uh, on each side uh, I have some energy, epsilon IJ, which is a random variable. Okay, so IJ, okay, I mean you can have, uh, that would be the direction I if you want. That will be the direction J if you want. Okay? Now, so this is one configuration of a polymer. So it's a configuration C. And now I assign some energy to this polymer. And this energy is simply the sum, the sum, sorry, of the energies of the points that you have met along, the, or, along your, your path here. Okay? So that's basically the sum of this energy plus this one, plus this one, this one, that one, this one, this one, and finally this one. Okay. So basically the energy of a configuration E of C uh, is just the sum uh, over all the, the couple IJ which belongs to the path of epsilon IJ. Okay, I mean it's a bit complicated way of writing something uh, really trivial. Okay, so that's just the sum of these, of these energies. And of course, I mean, uh, one important question uh, in, this, in this problem, and that many problems actually of, can be rephrased in terms of this directed polymer, uh, the main question that you may ask here is, is basically an optimization question. The question is, uh, what is the minimal energy that, you can, that, that, that I can find for a given realization of the configuration? That means that I would like to, to look at the mean, which will be, the minimum of all the, the minimum or the maximum, depending on on your problem. But okay, that's typically the kind of question that you would like to uh, to, 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 to to analyze here. Okay, so you would like to find the the optimal path if you want. Okay, so that that's the path uh, that costs the less energy. Now it's fairly uh, simple here to see that these random variables here are actually quite strongly correlated. Indeed, uh, suppose that. So I've, I've drawn here one of these of this of this path, 
Now let me look at another pass. Uh, then I could have this kind of path here. I could have this kind of guy. Now you see that on this path, it's pretty clear that uh, it will have uh, a non-zero non overlap with the, uh, the other guy here. So I will have a C prime here. And then in other words, that means that in other words, E of C and E of C prime will be actually quite strongly correlated simply because uh, there is uh, quite significant number of sites which are thus the same for the two paths. Okay, so obviously in this case, this E of C turns out to be extremely uh, correlated. Okay, and that's, okay, you have here a graphical way of seeing it. And this directed polymer model is actually very important uh, and uh, new tools uh, would have to be developed to study this problem. So the values E of C gets on the point. Now, so that means that the IID case of obviously can be Okay, is it better? So, in this case, uh, we have, oh. okay, let, let me do it more carefully. Okay, let's try. So again, that means that the IID case uh, cannot hold here, and does not hold, and is completely useless. Now it turns out that the full problem uh, turns out to be related to another extreme value questions, but in a different context. It turns out that uh, probably, I'm not sure I will have time to really cover this, but let me just tell you about it. It turns out that uh, the fluctuations, so if you ask about the distribution of E mean, for instance, so how is it possible to say something about the, the fluctuations of E mean? Well, it turns out that this, the fluctuations of E mean uh, are given by, are the same, in fact, are given by uh, the statistics or by the fluctuations uh, of another extreme, uh, which turns out to be the largest eigenvalue of random matrices. The largest eigenvalue of Hermitian random matrix. So what is it? What is it? Well, you take uh, a matrix, n by n matrix, and uh, then you fulfill the, the, the elements with uh, Gaussian independent uh, random variables, both real and complex, such that your matrix is Hermitian. Now you look at the eigenvalues of this matrix, it's a mission, so they are all real. And if you look at, uh, and you say, okay, I will look at the largest of them, let's call it lambda max. Now it turns out that lambda max has the same distribution as this guy. Okay, so that's uh, uh, relatively recent result from, from the 2000s now, it's, it's getting a little bit old, but, uh, and this is uh, related to maybe something that you have heard about, which is the Tracy Widom distribution. So if I have time, uh, I might say a few words, I mean, maybe more than a few words uh, about random matrices and extreme value questions in random matrices. Uh, but you already see that it has very nice applications to start make models. Yes, okay. I've seen you, yeah. That's true, yeah, 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 absolutely, yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you. I mean, of course, you can consider other cases, but what I'm saying here holds actually for IID. Yes? You mean which configurations? Well, I mean, the path, you see, I mean, okay, it's themselves, they are all a bit correlated, right? Because uh, uh, geometrically, they, 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 especially at the beginning, they will have a rather strong overlap. So they are not they are not IID in that sense. Okay, 
to talk about IID, you would need to, to define a, a probability measure on the path, which you can do. Uh, but uh, no, they are not IID. And what is clear is that, um, what, what, but I want, what I want to emphasize here is that these scalar variables here are not, are not associated to, to the path, are, not, are obviously not IID for the reason that I mentioned, okay? Because if you look at E of C and E of C prime, then you will have many of these epsilon i's will enter into the sum here. Yes. Yes, because, because of that, yes. But here, of course, I mean, the geometry of the graph itself makes induces some correlations on the C. Yes. Uh, that's true, yes. In that case, so I impose, yeah. Uh, in that case, I impose them to have, uh, say, uh, capital N, uh, capital N uh, steps, basically. Yes, that's true. So they will all end up at a fixed set. So that's if, if I think it as a time direction, all the, 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 the random walks here have a fixed length. Yeah, fixed number of steps. Yeah. Yes? Okay, there are some, uh, some cases. Uh, that means, so here you see, I mean, I've not specified uh, too much thing, so, but uh, I have actually here, uh, I said these epsilon i's are random variables. They are IID. Now, it turns out that for some specific choice of the distribution of this ep epsilon ij, for instance, if you choose them to be exponential, positive and exponential, and if you don't look at the minimum, but say in that case at, at the maximum, then in that case, there is, okay, there is an explicit connection with random matrices, which you can construct with some model of, of random matrices, which are called Wishart matrices. In that case, uh, you can write explicitly the, the distribution of the minimal energy here as the largest eigenvalue of some, uh, but that's a very specific model, and what is believed, and now, which is more and more, I mean, for, for which uh, there are more and more indications and sometimes rigorous proofs, is that this is actually quite universal. That means that it does not depend too much on these epsilon ij's. But the one-to-one -one correspondence, uh, first, uh, is quite mathematical, in the sense that there is no very good physical argument, and the other one is restricted and second is restricted to a very specific choice of epsilon ij. Okay. So yeah, so indeed, uh, so the, in any case, yeah, so this, in general, of course, I mean, this universality will be true, will hold in the limit where the polymers get very long. That means that here, and, on that, and, and then on that side, you need, you need to take large matrices. Essentially, the size of the matrix here, which is n, is roughly the, the, the number of steps that you have here. Other questions? Okay, so if not, uh, that, that's, that's bas that basically closes the, 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 this introductory part uh, where I hope uh, I could more or less uh, set up the problem and also give you some motivations uh, as to why we should care about these questions. Right, so now let me uh, just give you the, the, the outline, or at least uh, the, the, yeah, the current outline uh, in, my, in my mind of, 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 of uh, uh, the following lectures, and we will see how it goes. And of course, uh, this outline is not frozen. It could, uh, we could uh, adapt it. I don't know how far I can go, but basically uh, how, so that, that's how I plan to, 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 to go on. So basically, in the first part, uh, I want to do the, the extremes of IID random variables, and that I will cover it in, in quite details. Uh, uh, then uh, I want to go to these extremes, but for one, uh, and I want to cover in details, one example of uh, extremes for uh, a strongly correlated sets for uh, for strongly correlated examples. And okay, I chose to, uh, well, in fact, there are not so many systems for which we, we can say something about strongly correlated systems. 
uh, but I chose to talk uh, mainly on uh, random walks. Brownian motions. So random walk is discrete in time. Brownian motion is continuous in time. And I will also discuss the, the relevant case of Levy, Levy, Levy flights. OK. So given that, so I want to discuss the, 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 the extreme statistics of these guys. Uh, but since, OK, I, I thought that maybe uh, at least I wanted to be sure that everyone is clear about what these objects are. Uh, I plan to uh, have something here in between where I will do some overview of minimal requirements about uh, that will be just a remind. I mean, I, I will just recall this random walk, uh, etc. So that will be a, a reminder, OK? Either a reminder for those, for those of you who knows, uh, know this uh, by heart already. And otherwise, for those of you who are less uh, easy with that, uh, that will be the occasion just to to learn the, the, the minimum. Okay, I, I want I want these lectures to be as self-contained as possible, uh, so that's why I chose to do that. Okay, so then uh, so that will be for the extremes, and then uh, I wanted to I want to discuss another kind of uh, rare events or ex ex rare events type of uh, questions, uh, which is the case of uh, records. So I will discuss basically record statistics uh, for IID, and you will see that it has already a very nice uh, structure. Uh, so that will be one. And then I will, of course, because we, we will see that uh, I will have developed, in principle, all the tools uh, to, deep, to, to, to study then uh, the record statistics for random walks. Random walks, levy flights, and, and, and all this family. OK, and then depending on uh, whether I have time or not, uh, I would like to discuss various other examples of strongly correlated systems. And uh, I had in mind to discuss a bit random matrices. OK, so that will be, uh, again, the you see if I write here, or it's already too, too, too down? It's too, it's too down. So the last, OK, that will be more or less these kind of things. I mean, of course, I will probably not discuss this uh, Tracy rhythm, these results in detail, but at least give you, I would like, I mean, uh, if, if I have time, uh, that would be uh, basically other instance, I mean, other uh, examples of strongly correlated systems for which you can say something about the extreme statistics or rare event statistics. So yeah, I thought about random matrices because uh, this is pretty universal in the sense that random matrix, random matrices is used a bit, bit everywhere in many many areas. And given that uh, your topics uh, seem to be quite uh, broad, quite heterogeneous, also uh, probably random matrices and random walks are sufficiently universal so that uh, everyone can can have some interest. In. I could also discuss other ex other other examples. Uh, one would be could be, for instance, the, the, um, in the context of uh, fluctuating interfaces, stochastic interfaces, uh, like the KPZ, uh, Kardar-Parizizang uh, equations. Uh, but okay, uh, this would be maybe a bit more uh, too technical or too focused, at least. Um, so that that that's the plan. Okay. Is that fine? OK. So <clears throat> let's start with this, uh, with the first, uh, with this, uh, this first one. OK. Can I erase this? OK, so that's not the outline anymore. That's, uh, OK, uh, one, for instance. We could, we could call it one if we want, before it was zero. 
Okay, so I will really stick to this case. And uh, here is the, 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 so the problem we already uh, saw hit. So I have xn, x1, x2, xn, which are n random variables. And that means that, uh, okay, so I will use this, this letter to denote the probability. So the probability that xi is less than y is typically given by this. So it's just some notation if you want. Bx, p of x. Right? And so all, the, all this, you see that it's, it's independent of i here. So they are identical, and they are uh, uh, independent. So p of x, this is what I will call uh, the parent distribution. It's a density. And that, OK, so, and I will stick to the case, in fact, where uh, these random variables are continuous. OK, so they have a density. But there is no delta, uh, uh, delta component. So this excludes, for, this excludes, sorry, for instance, the random variables plus one, minus one. I mean, all what I'm saying, I mean, can be easily transposed uh, to this case. And the reason is the following. Uh, the reason why I'm, why I'm choosing this is the following is that I will actually uh, look at this random variable. Uh, yes. And I want to avoid some possible degeneracies. Okay, so that means that uh, if they have a continuous distribution, it's clear that with probability zero, uh, there will be uh, there will there will be two random random variables which are the same. And that means that instead, if you take plus one or minus one or whatever discrete random variables, you see that you might have some degeneracy for from x max. And this okay gives rise to some additional combinatorial problems which I just want to avoid here to start, okay? Fine, so they are identical here. And now uh, I want to discuss this and uh, obviously I could also discuss this guy, right? This mean, that's another. I will focus on, on this guy because, okay, because I, <laughs> I prefer to think in terms of this one, but uh, of course everything can just go through uh, and be transposed to x mean. So that, but I will be mainly focused, focused on that. Now, what do I mean by uh, inde independent? Well, I mean the following, that if you look at the joint law of, so let me define a joint PDF of x1, x2, xn, which is roughly the probability to observe x1, x2, and xn, within dx1, dx2, dxn, then this joint probability is just a product, okay? So that means that this joint density will be just this product here. So that will be p of x1 times p of x2 times p of xn. Okay? So is that clear? I mean, so this, the fact that here, the right hand side is independent of i means that they are identical. Now here, they are independent because of this uh, factorization uh, property. Okay, so the probability to observe jointly this x1, x2, xn is just the product of observing x1 times the product of observing x2, etc. Okay, so that's good to think about. That's basically the independence. Sorry. Here, this is more identical. So again, uh, we would like to, uh, to, to, to observe, uh, I mean, to say something about, about this. Now, so this is the maximum. Uh, now, you define the maximum, you define the minimum, but usually, more generally, one can define something which is slightly uh, more general here. And one can define what we usually call order statistics. What, is, uh, what, do, what do we usually mean by order statistics? Uh, you mean that you order these values, so you just rank uh, your values. So you rank, say, M1N, which is larger than M2N, uh, 
which is larger than, say, MNN, such that this one is actually X max. OK? This one is actually X min. OK? So you have a collection of ordered sequence. And if you look at the middle here, then you will have the case maximum. Okay, so in the middle here, you would have a guy which will be MKN. And this MKN is the case maximum, and it's sometimes called the case order statistics. Okay, so that's another it's a kind of generalization of, 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 of this. Okay, it's more complete if you want. Uh, and that's, uh, that's basically uh, the question. Okay, so MK of N uh, is the, what we call the order statistics. Case maximum. So in general, uh, so this is uh, a bit uh, the formal definition of the problem that we have. So we have this joint distribution, we have these random variables, and the question that that we ask uh, is basically uh, so that's our main question. Uh, we want to compute uh, the cumulative distribution of say of the the case maximum. And in particular, you would like to say something about what happens in the limit of large n. Of course, uh, this is where uh, you expect to have interesting things from a practical point of view. Uh, n is typically the, the, the number of uh, degrees of freedom that you have in your system. So taking the large n limit is like the thermodynamic limit, if you want. Okay. So that's, that's the idea. OK? So that's, that's the program. So I would like to show you essentially how one can completely understand this, uh, this fully understand this, this problem in this case. And I will do it uh, in two steps. Uh, I will first present you a kind of uh, heuristic argument uh, to get some information about the typical scale of this X max. And then uh, I will show some concrete computations that allows you to e compute explicitly this quantity. Or at least today I will certainly focus on k equal 1, so the maximum. And I want to show you that uh, for k equal 1, one has a closed expression in this IID case, and then one can do the large and asymptotic analysis. OK? Yes? Right. So typically, uh, if I had uh, in mind, if you had in mind this uh, polymer polymer problem that I had, then typically what, what is interesting is when your your polymer is quite long, okay? Then if the polymer is quite long, then you will have a lot of different <coughs> configurations. Typically, two to the power two to the power n in the in that case, but typically an exponential number uh, of configurations, exponential in the size of of, of the system. And that's usually where uh, you, you expect uh, to describe some thermodynamic uh, properties of, of a system. Okay. And so that means that that's really the limit uh, that, is, that is interesting. I'm not saying that having explicit results for finite n is, is, is uninteresting. I mean, this is obviously, in some cases, this can be quite, uh, quite, quite interesting. Uh, what we will see is that uh, in the large n limit, in this thermodynamic limit, it turns out that this limiting distribution is to a large extent independent of the parent distribution. Okay. That's a bit uh, equivalent to what we observe when you, do, when you look at the sum of random variables. Then you have a central limit theorem that tells you that under some technical assumptions, uh, you will have Gaussian fluctuations of this sum independently of the initial random variables. It turns out that this is also, there are equivalent results, not with the Gaussians, with some other functions that we will uh, uncover here. But there is also universal uh, behaviors uh, that will emerge there. And that will emerge in the long-gen limit. OK. So let's try with some heuristics. OK. So <clears throat> So it's OK. Uh, okay, now I will, uh, we just, uh, I will just look on, on the first maximum, say x max. Okay, and so I, I, I just 
want to show you some basic facts and formula. And then we'll see. So the first uh, basic fact is uh, what, I, what I want to call the, the typical value. So I want to estimate, so you give me a set of random variables, n of them, and I would like to estimate uh, the, the typical value of, of, of x max. So let me just, to set up the, 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 the problem properly, uh, let me make some assumption on p of x to start with. So I will suppose that p of x has a fine, I mean, is, is, is upper bounded. I mean, the support of p of x is upper bounded in the sense that if I look, if I look at p of x as a function of x, then the distribution of p of x is actually vanishes beyond a certain value, say, x star. Okay, so x star might be infinite, but you will see that to, to think about it, uh, it's sort of nice to, at least for me, it's sort of easier to, to think about it when x star is finite. So I don't know, maybe p of x could be just a, a uniform distribution between uh, minus 1 and plus 1 if you want. Now, the first fact, and which is, I think, quite intuitive. So imagine that, uh, imagine again that you have, uh, you, you, you just take some numbers between minus 1 and plus 1. You just generate them uh, randomly. You take a huge sample of them, 10 millions, and you look at uh, the largest one. And obviously, the largest one will be very close to 1 or close to the upper bound. Okay? And in fact, it will be even closer to x star if you increase n. So in other words, uh, the first thing that should be clear to you is that m1n will go with probability 1, will go to x star as n goes to infinity. Does it sound reasonable to you? I will not prove this, but this can be announced as a theorem. But that's a fact, and I think it's quite reasonable. OK? Now, of course, if x star is infinite, suppose that uh, you are taking uh, Gaussian random variables, that simply tells you that the maximum is, okay, goes to infinity as n goes to infinity, but it does not tell you how it goes with n. Does it goes like a power law? Does it goes exponentially? Does it goes whatever? We'll see that. Right, so that's, that's basically the, 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 the second thing that, that you would like. So I think that, that your question is, how close are you from, from x star when n goes to infinity, essentially? Okay. So that's the second question, but a bit more precise question that, uh, that, that, that you want to, to, uh, to, to, uh, to, to answer, is basically how close are you from x star? And for that, I will okay, denote mu n as the typical value of, uh, is a typical value of, of x max. So is it possible to estimate it? And in particular, uh, to estimate how mu n is close from x star. So there is a very nice and uh, rather simple argument to estimate that. But first, uh, one can. And OK, this can be also uh, proved rigorously. But uh, let's try to get this uh, heuristic argument, which is quite nice which goes as follows. So imagine that you look at the realization of this, uh, of this x size. So there is x star here. And you just order them. OK, so I don't know. For instance, here I will have uh, x, sorry. I will have x uh, 100 to 7. Uh, here 100 uh, to 3, 5. Uh, here I will have uh, x 4. Yeah, I don't know what I will have. And somehow here I will have x max. Okay, then I will have another guy here, which would be uh, x sub. Now, the question is, uh, how do I, wh what is the tip, how would I estimate the typical value of mu n? Okay, so if you give me such a sample, and uh, if you need to have an estimate of, 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 uh, of x max, then basically uh, what I claim is that a good estimate of the maximum, say mu n, is basically around here. And this mu n, which is the typical value of x max, is basically such that you have a finite amount of values, typically 1, 
between mu n and x star. Okay, so that's how I estimate this mu n. Let me just uh, write it explicitly. So what I what I'm what I what I claim is that mu n is such that the number of x size in the interval mu n x star is typically one. So it's of order one as n goes to infinity. That that's what it means. Okay. So that's that's the idea. So indeed, uh, if you take, if you say, okay, now mu n is somewhere there, and it's such that there is a huge number of values between mu n and the maximal value x star, then it's pretty clear that it would not be a good estimate of, of, of the maximum, right? Because there are many, too many of them uh, which are uh, in between, and that means that this does not give you, this does not give you any information about the actual value of the maximum. On the other hand, it's also clear that if you are much greater than x star here, or at least much greater than x max here, such that you don't have any uh, values in this interval mu n x star, then typically it's also you are very off. You are really off uh, from the typical value. But the correct, the correct way to estimate this is typically by saying that, right? This is not an arbitrary definition. OK, what is arbitrary? is this one here, okay? But uh, one should understand the thing by saying that this is of order n uh, to the power of zero, okay? So that's when n goes to infinity, uh, this has to be of order one, okay? So the fact that this is one here is indeed arbitrary, but the fact that what is not arbitrary is the fact that it's not, it does not depend on n, okay? So when n goes to infinity, that's what gives you the correct estimate. I will set it to one for convenience, and it turns out that the theorem that you can prove uh, show you that this is one exactly, um, but that gives you uh, an estimate of mu n, right? Because how do I estimate this? So I can, so this is an estimate for mu n, so I can just now compute the average value of the number of xi's which are in this uh, interval, okay? So that's, uh, if I want to compute, say, the, the average number, of x i's, uh, which are in mu n x star, well, this I can easily compute, right? Because uh, what is the probability that one of x i's is in this interval here? So for one variable, this is mu n x star dx p of x. Okay, so that's, if you give me one of the x i's that's the probability that one of the xi lies within this interval. And now you have capital N random variables like that, x1, x2, xn. So the total average number is just n times this. Okay? And this tells me that this should be of order one. Okay? So that's what fixes the value of x1. Right. Okay. So mu n is basically <laughs> this quantity here. So uh, what I what mu n is 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 the typical scale. So that means that I want to estimate how x max will grow as n goes to infinity. Okay. So I want to set up to to estimate this value. You will see that this later on it has some more precise. Uh, uh, it coincides with some other precise uh, observables associated to this order of statistics, but. At the moment, I just want to have an estimate of the scale of x max, okay? So, and, and, and again, uh, the way I, I'm, setting, uh, I'm setting that is just by saying that this mu n here is just such that, you see, I mean, it's roughly x max. So we, x max is basically such that there is only a single random variable in that, in that, in that range here, okay? Sorry? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So this, so what I'm saying is that this mu n here is is exactly that, right? I mean, mu n mu n is not one of the random variables, right? Mu n is just a scale that I fix uh, from from. Okay, I just look at this 
at this at, at one realization of the x size, and I just want to to, to have a, a reasonable estimate of of this value. Okay, but mu n is is none of these values. Okay, it's just I'm saying that this is just uh, an estimation of the value of x max, and that should be such that the number of eigenvalues within this is specifically one, one because this one should be x max itself. Okay. Then later on, you will see that in many cases, mu n actually coincides with the average value of x max. We will see that. Yes. Right. So x star is the uh, yeah. So x max is bounded by x star. Okay. Because all the suppose that let let's take the, the this 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 simplest case here. Right. So let's think that you have this kind of guy, the distribution. Okay, so I, I so p of x is this is this quantity. So x this is x star. Okay, so this is the, the yeah exactly this is the, the the edge of the support. Okay, so x max now is the following. So imagine that you are drawing uh, at at uh, random. Uh, you are drawing some random numbers between minus one and plus one, okay? Then it's clear that none of them will be exactly one. None of them will be exactly one. But what is happening is that if you take say, ten, 10 random variables, okay, there will, you will have some which are quite close to one. If you take one million, I mean, you will see that the largest one obviously will be quite close to x star. And as n goes to infinity, it will be very close, as close as you wish from x star. But for finite n, there will be some fluctuations. Okay? And that's what I'm trying now to estimate. Is that clear? Other questions? Okay. So, so now it's nice because we have a, a very nice formula when one can evaluate it for various distribution. Uh, you will see. No, this this is not uh, at the moment. You cannot get it. I will come to that in a minute. I should maybe hurry up. Okay. So now one can let let's let's try to evaluate it for a few uh, few cases such such that we get some some estimate or that we see what what it gives. So let's just evaluate this formula on some concrete examples. Okay. So let's let's look at this model, which is somehow the, the simplest that I just. Uh, uh, mentioned with you, yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm even doing something even even simpler. What well, even simpler? Uh, so let's look at some examples. So for instance, uh, I will do three examples. So let's let's take p of x is equal to one if x is in between zero one and zero uh, if it's not. Okay, so that's uh, the same door distribution, right? So that's the zero one. So x star is equal to one here, okay? And so now let, let's just evaluate this integral. So it's just it's n times the integral from mu n to x star, which is one, times dx p of x, which is one, okay? P of x is just one. And that should be equal to one. Okay, and so you immediately get that here uh, mu n. So you get so if I just integrate this, okay, so you get one over uh, one my n minus mu n is just equal to one, and that gives you the typical scale of mu n. Mu n is just one minus uh, one over n. Okay, so you see again that if I look at uh, the the typical value. It's probably better to think like this. I mean, basically, it's one minus mu n uh, is equal to is of order one over n. So that's basically related to the question that you are asking, and that you are also uh, asking, uh, Mark, a little bit uh, before. Is this is the rate, if you want? So you have your random variables. There is one here, and if you look at uh, x max here, well, what you what you get is that typically x max. So this is now okay. X max, if you want. Uh, it, it's 
the typical distance is one over n. Okay, that, that's what it means. Yes. Sure. So indeed, I mean, so for instance, here if you here it's it's quite simple. But if you have something that vanishes, for instance, like one minus x to the power alpha, then uh, this will behave like one one over n to the power alpha plus one or something like that. Yeah. So this crucially depends on what happens at the edge. But you see also that it only depends on that. So now you don't you don't care. I mean, p of x here could be anything, right? I just need uh, you you see it on this formula. You really only what controls the large end behavior is really the vicinity of, of x star. You don't care too much about what happens for x negative, for instance, or for x equals zero. You don't care. You just need to know how it behaves close to x star, and that will control the typical scale. And not only the typical scale, as we as as we will see, but the full distribution, in fact. Okay. That is mu n. Okay. <coughs> so that's the typical scale. Yeah, thank you. Okay. So let's look at another example, which is uh, quite uh, nice to study, which is the exponential case. Exponential is for extreme value statistics. It's quite nice because, oh, so let's, let's just investigate this formula. So let's just get another example, right? Uh, where I will get p of x uh, is just exponential of minus x when x is positive and 0 otherwise. So this is a case where x star is infinite. But this formula also holds when x star. Uh, maybe I, it's nice to, to point it out or to write it explicitly. Uh, that also holds for x star equal to plus infinity, okay? I mean, you can just repeat the argument. There's nothing, uh, I mean, everything will go through. So here what you get, if you apply this formula, uh, you get that you will get this, 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 this quantity, right? Now, this is just exponential of x. This is equal to 1. And then you see that it gives you x n exponential of minus mu n is equal to 1. And that immediately gives you that mu n is log n. Yes? Is infinite. Uh, well, because if you think a little bit about it, I mean, you can just, uh, just repeat everything that I said uh, with the next star, which is infinite. Yeah, so you want to, yes. Right. Well, you just say that you want, you, you want, you estimate mu n such that there is just a single variable between mu n and plus infinity. This is a well-defined question. And it admits a well-defined answer, I believe. No? No, you are not happy with it? Oh, it, it does not, it, it's, it's not, I mean, yeah, the, you can do the, the limiting procedure even. I mean, you can define the, OK, so that's one case. Uh, you could actually, uh, I can leave it as an exercise, uh, but I will not do it. But if you have a Gaussian, so you see that it goes very slowly, actually. I mean, if you take exponentials, I mean, the maximum is, is very, is just, log is almost a number. I mean, it's, it goes to infinity, of course, but, uh, right? So if you take uh, p of x, which is 1 over sigma square root of 2 pi, exponential minus uh, x square divided by 2 sigma square, uh, I leave you as an exercise uh, to show that uh, that the maximum uh, okay. is even, grows actually even, uh, even more slowly. It actually uh, evolves like square root of log n. It's very slow, and uh, in fact, uh, the coefficient you can actually compute it is just sigma square root of two. Right. 
let me, so that's, you see, I mean, in this case, the maximum is something which is uh, extremely, uh, extremely small. Uh, now let, let's look at a heavy tail distribution. Let's look, for instance, the case of Cauchy. So I take one over pi divide uh, times one, and x is real in this case. So this is the Cauchy law. It has a power law tail, so it's pretty different from the Gaussian, pretty different from the exponential, and also, of course, pretty different from uh, the other cases where you have a finite support. Uh, and then you can just repeat uh, what we did, right? That means that in this case, uh, you have n. So in principle, uh, I have x dx over pi, 1 over z x squared. This should be equal to 1. So you have to solve this equation. You can integrate it. But you know that mu n here is very large. So I can just approximate here 1 over 1 plus x squared by 1 over x squared. So I would get, I get the pi here, and then you see that you get 1 over x squared equal to 1. OK, now this is just 1 over mu n. And that gives you that mu n is just n over pi, n by pi. So in that case, you see that things are quite different. It goes quite fast. And in this case, mu n goes linearly with n, right? So you really see that, uh, as, as already mentioned, the, the, the growth of mu n as a function of n depends quite, quite a bit on the distribution of p of x, right? We have seen all sorts of, of, of uh, uh, behavior. Uh, the case where x star was finite and when we have fluctuations of order 1 over n at the edge, then we have seen this log n behavior for the exponential and the an infinite support, the square root of log n. And now we get yet something else for the, for the, 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 the power law. But this, what, what is nice is that we have this formula. And this formula actually uh, encodes already a lot of information and is valid for any p of x. OK, so that was uh, kind of, yes. Yeah, well, actually, you can get uh, even, uh, OK, so you can get the, uh, you can get even, uh, even uh, faster. So you can, you can imagine that you have the fastest that you can imagine, OK, fastest. You, at least faster than that, 1 over x to the power 1 plus alpha. So if you have, OK, so that's, in this case, you will have 1 over x to the alpha. 1, so, sorry, OK, let's, let's do it. So it's just a remark. Yeah, yeah, sure. So that's why you need to, you, so p of x can be of this form. 1 plus alpha with alpha positive, OK? And, and then, uh, then you immediately see that uh, then you will get higher powers uh, as it goes, OK? So we can uh, get, look at it. So you will have n, and, uh, and here you will need to have basically, yeah, that's just uh, 1 over mu n uh, to the power alpha. Uh, which is of order 1, and that gives you a uh, mu n, which is n to the power uh, 1 over alpha. OK, but alpha can be very small. And so, yeah, yeah, you can have anything you want. But still, still algebraic. I mean, yeah, it's, it's hard to get something uh, exponential or whatever. Okay. Though it's not, in, for IID, it's quite hard. I don't, don't know in any cases. Okay, so that's for the mean, so the typical value, which as we will see is essentially the, the, the mean value. Now we would like to have something more. We would like to have the, the full distribution of, of the maximum. Okay, so that's uh, where uh, that's where we are now. Okay, so we really want to, to have a complete, an exact expression for the cumulative distribution of the maximum. Okay, so that's the, the, an important thing here is that to compute this, statistics here, and in, in fact, in many cases in probability, uh, instead of computing the, the PDF, that means the, the, the density, it's usually easier to compute the cumulative distribution. OK, so that's uh, the second. So this is, all, again, in, the, in, in this part of about facts and formula. Uh, and here I want to, to show you that it's, 
an exact formula. Oh, so for what I call the cumulative distribution function. Max. Okay, so this C B F. So what is that? Uh, this is okay. The, the definition. And this is what I will denote by F one n of m. One because this is the first maximum. N because this is the total among the, the total number of of, of uh, random variables, and m, which is the variable that I want to focus, and this is just the probability that x max is smaller than m. Okay, so that's actually very uh, convenient to compute because if you think a little bit about it, what is this distribution? What are the events that contribute to, this, uh, to these probabilities? Well, this is simply the probability that x1 is smaller than m, x2 is smaller than m, xn is smaller than m. Okay? So essentially the probability that the maximum is smaller than m is just the same as the probability that all of them are smaller than m. But now, these guys, these random variables are independent, so these joint probabilities here that you are computing they are just products, okay? They are, they're just factorized because you remember that the joint PDF of the, X, of the Xi's is just a product measures of the P of Xi's. So this is just the probability that X1 is less than M times the probability that X2 is less than M dot, dot, dot times the probability that Xn is, is less than M, okay? So here I use the fact that they are independent Is that fine? But now we know that they are all identical. They are all the same. So actually this probability that x1 is less than m is the same as the probability that x2 is less than m. So that means that this is just essentially the probability. So this is just the product from one from i equal 1 to n of this probability of each, each of them. This is each of them. This is, I started basically with that. This is nothing else but the probability from minus infinity to m, p of x dx. Okay, so here I just use the fact that they are indeed identical. And in other words, this is just this guy to the power n. Okay, so eventually you see that, and that's really the, 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 the reason why the IID case is extremely simple here is that we have uh, a quite explicit formulas, uh, an explicit formula, in fact, in this case, to compute this, 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 this object here. Is that clear? So that, that's quite important because uh, you have an exact formula to start with. That's the first, usually, a very important uh, fact. And in addition, it turns out that here, this explicit formula is also quite simple. Nevertheless, uh, if you don't know anything, if you have never so this, if you never saw this problem before, uh, analyzing the larger limit of that is not completely trivial, and it requires some, some computation. So let's try now to see how it goes through. I mean, how we can get the asymptotic analysis of that. I will, of course, not do all the details. Uh, this, this, actually, these computations are uh, now already, uh, it, it started in, 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 in the 20s, in fact. Uh, the first results were obtained uh, in the, 20, I mean, 25, between uh, 1925, 1930. And essentially, the, the big theorem uh, was eventually established by a Russian, by Nedenko, in the 40s, 42 or 43. So I will not repeat uh, all this here, uh, because the analysis is also pretty heavy. But I just want to give you the, 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 the flavor of, of, uh, of what happens in the large end limit. Well, the first thing that one has to say is that if I look at this distribution, let's have a look at how, how does it look like, this, this function. So this function here, if you plot it, 
you see it's a cumulative distribution, okay? So if I look at this guy as a function of as a function of m, right? So roughly speaking, uh, what what happens? You see, I mean, when m is very small, then basically the probability that, it, that it x max is smaller than uh, than a very small number will be zero. So it will go from zero when m is very small, and eventually when m is very large, uh, it will go to, to one, okay? So this S1n is, is, is essentially, is a, roughly speaking, it's a step function, right? Now, when n goes to infinity, if you don't do anything, if you don't do anything, uh, suppose that uh, x star is, is, is finite, uh, what will happen is that uh, in the limit when n goes to infinity, this, 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 this function will be just a, a simple step function at x star. So there's nothing. So x star, remember that it's just the, the, the edge of the support of, of p of x. So in the limit when n goes to infinity, uh, of course, this function is, is is not really uh, interesting, it's just, it's just a, a theta function. Okay. So what, what it means really is that uh, uh, theta of, uh, so is one when uh, m, yeah. Okay. So what it means is that uh, you need to do some rescaling to obtain a non-trivial limit. And uh, what it means is that uh, to obtain a non-trivial limit, uh, of uh, f one n of m, well, you, we need actually to center and rescale this this variable m, and so that means that. Uh, that means the following. Okay, I will write it and then I will comment. One needs to find uh, a n and b n such that is it still readable if I write here or just here and then then uh, such that what such that this guy. So let's write it in a proper way. limit when n goes to infinity of f 1 m of n a n plus b n z. So I'm writing m as a n plus b n z such that this goes when n goes to infinity to some well-defined function, some function g of z. Okay, so let's, I need to be a little bit more precise. So first I convinced you that the cumulative distribution is not very interesting, but something maybe which is uh, more, I mean, uh, which is more interesting to plot is the PDF. So that means that the derivative with respect to M of this quantity, so that's really the PDF. So if I, so what I'm saying here, roughly, I mean, essentially is that if you compute this, if you look at this guy as a function of, of m, what do you expect? That's basically written here. What you expect uh, is the following. You expect that, if you, so you remember, for instance, uh, have in mind that the, the case of the exponential case. We were saying that the maximum, typical value of the maximum goes like log n. So that means that if you look at the distribution of the maximum, it will be roughly speaking centered about mu n. For the exponential, it will be, uh, uh, okay, it will be something like log n, but something which is proportional to mu n or similar to mu n. We will say exactly what it is, but, and then it will have this shape, right? The precise shape we don't know, but essentially it will be picked around some value, 
And this mu n, this is exactly what I call here a n, to be precise. So that's precisely what a n is, okay? So I am looking at the distribution of f1 n, but close to a n, okay? So that's this value here, which turns out to be indeed similar to mu n. And then it will have also some width, okay? And the width, uh, the width basically uh, is roughly, uh, is this Bm. So that's what uh, Bn is, okay? So the similar kind of things actually happens when you look at the, 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 the central limit theorem. Uh, when you look at the, uh, let me just make a comment uh, to, to make the, the, the parallel between the, the two, uh, two cases. So that's quite important. I will just let it here. Just a remark, I mean, just to, to, to tell you that what, what we are looking at, what we are looking for here is quite, uh, I mean, should not sound too, 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 too crazy, at least. Uh, so if you think about the sum of IID, Now, so that means that I look at Sn, which is basically the sum of, uh, of this random variable, and suppose that Xi has a well-first-defined moment, which is mu, and suppose that it has also uh, a variance, which is also well-defined, then you know that the law of large numbers tells you that Sn so when n is large, uh, Sn is basically n times mu. Okay, so that's the law of large numbers. So in that case here, in our case, this is the equivalent of An. Okay, so that's the typical value. So if you look at the, the PDF of the sum here, it will have some, uh, some, it will be centered around the mean value, which is n mu in this case. And then we know that there are some fluctuations around this, this mean value, and the fluctuations are of order square root of n, which is my bn here. There is a sigma here, which comes from that, and then there is a random variable here, which I call chi index j. Oh, okay. Probably you know all of you this notation, n01. n01 between the being the, 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 the Gaussian uh, So it's a Gaussian random variable with unit variance and centered around zero, right? So this is the equivalent of, of that, right? That means, uh, so n mu here is the equivalent of a n for us. So that's this, this a n here. And this b n here is just this guy. So that's basically what I'm looking after. So in that case, of course, if you do that for the sum for Sn, what you will find is that G of Z is itself is a Gaussian random variable. This is that. Now, the question I am asking is what are these distributions for the IID case? What are the equivalent, or what is, or what are the equivalent of the Gaussian normal distribution? Okay, so that's Gaussian random variable. So the question is, is really uh, whether I can find this, uh, these numbers, a n and b n, and what is then the, in that case, what is the limiting distribution g of z? Okay, so that's, that's our goal. Is that clear? I mean, if not, I, I should repeat it because uh, yeah, I think it's important enough. Yeah, okay, so the idea is that, uh, <clears throat> so a n, these are just numbers, and this is my m, okay, so this is initially my m. 
So z is the is the random variable associated to this one. Okay. Is it okay? So I just set. Okay. Uh, in other words, uh, and, and yeah. Okay. Maybe I should write it this way. Uh, what what does it mean? Another way to interpret this is that I write. So basically, uh, what is this g of z? I am now writing the maximum, so x max. I choose to write it as the following. I write it as a n plus b n times a random variable chi. And the cumulative distribution of chi is precisely the g of z that I wrote there. I mean, that's, that's the probabilistic content of this formula. Okay, so I write x max. I'm saying that this is a n plus, some, plus b n times some random variable. This random variable does not depend on n. That, that, that's the crucial point. And I want to know the distribution of this guy. Again, if instead of x max, I would have the sum of random variables, then that would simply be a Gaussian random variable with unit variance. Now, in our case, the question is, what is the g of z, right? Is that OK? So the PDF, so g prime of z, will be this limiting function, right? Is that clear? OK. So I think I still have some few minutes, right? OK, so at least I would like to give you more or less the, I will not do the, the full analysis, but uh, I will tell you what the results are. Okay. So that's the, again, uh, the nice thing, of course, is that we have an explicit formula for F1 on N, right? This is just uh, the, this, uh, um, the formula that I showed you before in terms of the uh, parent distribution P of X. And now one can do uh, the, the full analysis. So in general, the full analysis is, is Okay, it's a bit lengthy to do. Uh, I will not do in detail, but instead, uh, what I propose you is uh, to give you the, the results and maybe give you, treat some simple cases and to convince you that the general results uh, are quite reasonable to believe. So let me tell you the, 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 the full, the result of the full analysis. So, so this is the so the first first part was this uh, facts and formula and now uh, the second part is the lim what I call limiting behavior. Uh, for n to infinity. So it turns out that uh, in general a n and b n are a little bit complicated to compute. Well, a n in many cases is just mu n that we have seen before. Bn is something else. Uh, but the, the striking facts, but in general, so An and Bn depends on P of x. Now, the striking uh, and quite nice result is that the G of z here cannot be anything. Okay, so there are essentially three universality classes. So that means that G of z can only take three different forms that I will just uh, give to give now. So there were only, only three uh, distinct universality classes. Uh, which are indexed by this number rho, which can take uh, the three value. No, OK. I will take one, two, three. And this three distinct universality classes, they only depend on the behavior of the parent distribution close to the edge, okay? I will be, I, I'll write it and I will be, I will give examples. So they depend only, uh, depending on the behavior of P of X, so I remind you that P of X is the parent distribution of the, the X size of P of X 
uh, near uh, near x star. So near x star, if x star is finite, and uh, you have the behavior uh, at infinity. if x star is infinite. Okay. So that already tells you that depending on you have whether you have a finite uh, support or not, uh, you will uh, get different universality class. So let's let's begin with the first class, rho equal 1. This is probably the, the most famous and this is called the Gamble universality class. And this corresponds to the case where X star is, okay, where P of X, okay, P of X uh, decays faster than any power law when X goes to infinity. Okay, so. Uh, for any eta. Okay, so that means that P of X decays faster than any power law. So most, in, most in most of the applications, x star is finite, but it can also be that uh, it, is, uh, it has a finite support, and this would correspond to a P of x, which is quite singular, vanishing like exponential of one, uh, like exponential of one over x minus x star. But okay, usually x star is infinite. I will just leave it like this. Okay, so you have something typically the exponential that we have uh, seen, seen before, or the Gaussian. Financial random variable Gaussians, etc. So that's the, the, the first class, uh, and in that case, uh, one has uh, specific uh, limiting distribution. Uh, maybe I can already say it. So in this first case, I will come back to this probably uh, in the next lecture, but I'll just. Yeah, exactly. Precisely, yes. So in all these cases, uh, you don't know to know, I mean, no need to know anything about, okay, at least uh, to compute the limiting distribution. Uh, the limiting distribution does not depend on the details of the P of X. So again, it can be exponential, Gaussian. And in this case, the G of G, the function G of Z is actually G1 of Z, is actually this double exponential that you have seen. And this is defined uh, on, 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 on the total, uh, on the full uh, real line. Right, so that's the first universality class. Uh, I guess uh, I will probably come back to this a uh, little bit tomorrow with some concrete examples. But that's nice to see this universality class. Now there is a second universality class which precisely corresponds to the fact when, uh, to the case where you have a power law uh, decay. Okay, so in this case, you need to have x star, which is infinite. And then uh, p of x decays algebraically. Okay, so you have p of x, which is, say, uh, x to the power minus eta, or how did I choose it? Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so suppose that it, it's, it's like that. So it's x to the power minus 1 minus alpha. So you can have some constant here when x goes to infinity. Okay, so you can, that means that you have an algebraic decay, but alpha can be big. I mean, alpha can be, it's, it's not necessarily a fat tail. I mean, alpha need not to be small. Alpha can be 100 if you want. Uh, and in this case, you have another class, which is called the Frechet class. And you have another limiting form. And G2 of Z, in that case, is just exponential of, uh, yeah, we, Okay. Yeah, okay, it has this form. So it's basically exponential minus Z, exponential minus alpha for Z positive and is zero otherwise. Right, so that's quite different from 
from this guy. And there is a third class, which is the class uh, that uh, I initially discussed before. For instance, the case where you have a uniform distribution between 0 and 1. And this is called the viable distribution. So that's the third case. I guess I should better write it here. <coughs> I just want to have it let it here. And so that the first case is the third, third case, rho equal to 3. And this is the case where x star is finite. And where now you have what we said before with what we already discussed a bit before. So you have uh, rho of p of x, sorry, which decays now at x star with some power law. Yes? Right. That's true. Yes. Well, OK, this is most of the cases. Um, because I didn't want to, OK, there, there, there is a, <laughs> uh, so most, most of the case that you will encounter is the case where p of x decays, uh, where x star is infinite and decays faster. OK, OK. okay. There is some details around it for x star finite, which I don't want to enter, but uh, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, in all these cases, I write x, x max, I, I write it as a n plus b n z. And, okay, and, and the distribution of z is this guy. The cumulative distribution of z is this guy. So what I will do probably tomorrow is that I will uh, analyze some specific cases in all the, the, the three universality classes such that we understand really what... Uh, uh, what, what's happening here? Yeah, I just want to give the the, the, the results, and then eventually, uh, if okay, so p of x uh, now will decay as x star minus x to some uh, power. Let's call it nu, for instance, or let's call it uh, no, let's call it alpha again, alpha minus one. Okay, so you have these kind of things, but it can also be diverging, but with a, an integrable singularity. And then you have yet another class, which is called now the viable class. I'm sure you have, you have heard about this, these names here. Uh, of course, uh, so it's, okay, it has this form, uh, which is one, okay, let's, let's go it for z, is one for z positive. And for z negative, it has some expression that I'm writing here, exponential minus mod z to the power alpha uh, when z is negative. I hope it's readable. Can you read everything which is written there? So, yeah, these three functions here, uh, the Gamble, the Frechet, and uh, the Weibull functions here, they are the equivalent of the Gaussian distributions for the sum of IID random variables. So they are as universal, if you want, as, as the Gaussian. And that's actually why they pop up a bit everywhere. I mean, they, many problems, uh, you, will, you will find this, this function uh, appearing. And the reason is because they are attached to some universality classes. And uh, that means that they do not depend too much on the details of P of X, only the large x, only the large x behavior of p of x happens, okay. matters, sorry. Now, I didn't say so much about the coefficients a n and b n. Uh, we will come back to this uh, tomorrow. Uh, in many cases, a n is more or less like a mu n. I didn't say anything about b n, but there, are, there exists some formula uh, to compute it. So, uh, I guess that uh, that's so, somehow what, what uh, what I would like to, 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 yeah, to, to do tomorrow probably is to, uh, again, I will not prove this, this, these things. I mean, you can do it as a physicist would do. I mean, it's, it's a bit of work. But uh, I would like instead to show you some examples where one can rather easily obtain these, uh, these distributions and, and then so that you are quite confident that these results are, are reasonable. Uh, and then I will discuss briefly what these ANs, BNs are. 
And I will then end up by uh, generalizing these computations. So here I've discussed the, the first, uh, first maximum. But as I said, one can actually uh, look at the distribution of the case maximum. Right? Uh, uh, that means that instead of looking at the first guy, you can look at the tenth guy or the, the guy number 20 and ask the same question. Is it possible to derive a limiting distribution? The answer is yes. There are some very nice formulas for that. And I just would like to show you rather briefly because the computations uh, are quite simple and give you the, the, the finally the, the asymptotic results in the large n limit for the order statistics. Uh, and that will close uh, what I will want, would like to, to tell you about uh, the IID case. Uh, and then, as I said, uh, I will go to, I would like then to discuss basically how these results do extend uh, in the case of uh, random walks which is a nice example of um, strongly correlated um, system. And uh, for this, uh, I would like to remind you some basic properties, uh, known or not so well-known properties about random walks. Uh, and then we will see how it goes on to, to extract the extreme statistics for that. And then, uh, as I said, we will go to the, to the records and see, uh, and see uh, how we can handle uh, all these questions both for IID and for uh, random walks again. Okay, thank you.